بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار شاء الله عن توزة يا أخواني وغن تديو بذي common mistakes that people make while praying taken from the book of Sheikh Nasir al-Din al-Albani's student Rahimullahu Ta'ala Abu Ubaidah Mashhur al-Salman Abu Ubaidah Mashhur Hassan Salman and this book is available on the internet as a book that's free we won't go through the whole book because it is very thick but we'll deal with the issues that are common amongst people who we live around and who we live with. And that is because the very first thing that Allah Azawajal is going to ask the person about Yom Al-Qiyamah when he's judged is his salah. So the most important issue from the keys to get an individual into the Jannah, that is, aqeed has to be correct. He's going to be asked in his grave, Men Rabbuka, those issues connected with his aqidah. And what do you have to say about that man who came, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, following the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, whose dawah was the dawah of a tawheed, the dawah that was opposed and against a shirk and al kufr. And it is the way that the person is going to understand and comprehend what is a tawheed. And then the second most important issue is the issue of the salat. So on Tuesday, bi-idhnillah azza wa jal, yawm al-thuratha, we're going to deal with the common mistakes. On the calendar, they put fiqh al-salat, fiqh al-salat, comprehending and understanding the prayer, ahkam of the prayer. But we won't get into all of the details about the salat, just those mistakes that are common, and they are untashir bain al-nas. And on Wednesday, in preparation for Ramadan, we're going to deal with some of the issues that are connected with that. We need to know about fasting correctly. So we have, bi'idhnillah, more than a month to take 12 classes, 13 classes in preparation for Ramadan. Try to make this upcoming Ramadan and Ramadan, unlike the previous Ramadanat that have passed in our lives. So today, inshallah, We'll deal with the issue of the Salat, although today is Wednesday. The class of the Salat, the mistakes of the Salat is going to be on Tuesday, bi'idhnillah. And on Wednesday, the Sawm, the Siyam, the Fiqh of Siyam, Sawm. But today, inshallah, is one uh, exception, and that is we'll deal with the Salat today. If we want to talk about the mistakes of the Salat, there are many mistakes that we can mention even before the prayer. Many things that can take a month, two months. Like the mistake of praying without a niyyah or praying with the wrong niyyah. Like the mistake of praying in the right place. The fact that you have to pray in a, a place that is legislated. All of those are from the muqaddimat that can be mentioned. We're not going to get into that. But there is one issue that we have to mention. And there are a lot that are important, like the wudu, making the wudu properly. Making the wudu properly. But I think, I know someone dealt with some of the issues of al wudu in detail, so we won't uh, reinvent the wheel and go over that. From the things that are connected to the prayer, before you even pray, is what people wear in relationship to making preparations for a salat. And there are a lot of mistakes in this issue. 
for a person prays to Allah Azza wa Jal, he has to make sure that what he's wearing is appropriate because he may pray the prayer with khushu' and ikhlas and the mechanics of the prayer are correct, but because he's doing something in terms of what he's wearing or not wearing, his salat can be rendered null and void or it can be naqasa, incomplete, deficient. Allah commanded in the Quran an ayat, he commanded with an ayat, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjidin, O sons of Adam, wear your beautiful apparel, your beautiful clothes at every masjid. The meaning of this ayat with the ittifaq and the ijma' of the ulama. So this ayat is referring to what the kuffar Quraysh used to do when they didn't dress properly. They used to not cover up their aura. And they would go around the Kaaba naked, some of them. So the ayat told the people, the Muslims, wear your beautiful apparel, meaning cover up your aura. Cover up your aura at every masjid. And the meaning of masjid here means the salat. At every salat, cover up your aura. And then you have the general meaning, which is, as you're going to see, inshallah, you should wear nice clothes for prayer, clothes that are acceptable. And also, and also, in addition to that, from what's going to come out, what's going to be illustrated is that you should avoid those issues, we should avoid those issues that have been prohibited. And there are a lot of issues connected to the dress. First of all, Ikhwani, is the issue of covering up the aura. So we mentioned this is the meaning of the ayah. Some of the ulama of the past and the ulama today of the opinion that the way some of the Muslims dress today in terms of wearing pants and so forth and so on, wearing a shirt and pants, that is a salat that is, you know, disliked. I'm not going to get into that because we're living in this place. I would suggest and encourage and advise people to hold on to the Islamic clothes, the thobe, the sirwal al-khamis, Whatever clothes that you wear that are from the countries where we come from has a lot of benefit connected to that. But I'm not going to get deep into that, but it should be understood that some of the ulama looked at that as being the least you could say is makruh, something that's disliked. When Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us to wear our beautiful apparel at every masjid, part of that is the type of clothes that a person is wearing, like those clothes should be Islamic clothes and clothes that the Muslims are known by. But as it relates to the aura, people who do wear pants, sometimes you wear pants, if a person were to make sajda, sometimes his aura is exposed. The pants, they show the contours of a person's body, the front and the back. And as a result of that, a person shouldn't stand before Allah in that type of a way. The Prophet told the community, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has the right that you beautify yourself for him. If anyone had the right that you present yourself in a good way, then it's Allah Azza wa Jalla, especially at the time of the prayer. So I'm mentioning this so that you would know, not to put anyone down, not to make anyone uncomfortable. If you had the ability, if you had the ability, you have the ability. Your children are under your supervision. You have boys and so forth and so on. This is something that the Muslim community should struggle with and make jihad for. That we put not negative pressure but we make those who are under our authority feel hey it's better to hold on to our clothes where we come from am i saying it's haram to wear bunt alone i'm not saying it's haram but what i am saying is that those ulama who we take our religion from looked at that issue as being an issue that is makro because of the way those clothes look because they're showing the contours of the body when a person is making sajda and other than that so the Muslim should be totally covered. Just like the woman is commanded to be covered, the Muslim man as well, especially those parts that are sensitive from his aura. Concerning the dress, from what has to be mentioned is, it is impermissible for the aura to be exposed. And this is more so for the woman, our wives, our daughters, women who are under our authority. And this is an issue that many women, they are laxed in. It's a major mistake in the prayer of the Muslim. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam told us, لا يقبل الله تعالى صلاة حائدا 
illa bi khimaran. Allah will not accept the prayer of a grown woman. A grown woman, a woman who has her period, akramakumullah, meaning she's old, she's old enough to pray. Allah will not accept her salat except that she covers herself up properly. She has to cover herself up properly, cover everything up. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he made sure that he taught his wives the importance of this issue. What is the aura of the woman? The aura of the woman is everything except what necessarily must appear from her, her face and her hands. And Imam al-Shafi'i and other than him from the ulama of islam they said that the only thing that can show from a woman in her prayer is her face and her hands. Those things that can be seen outside of the prayer. It's not permissible for her hair to be seen, her forearms to be seen, her neck to be seen, the dress that many of the women wear, wherever they come from, especially the one where they just wrap themselves with something, Sudan, Sudani women, for an example, Indian women, Pakistani women, the Muslim women who just wrap themselves with that thing and it continuously falls off, the neck is showing, the hair is showing, not permissible to pray in that. It's haram for the Muslim lady to pray in that if that's all that she has. And it keeps coming off. If she has it and it covers up everything, then no problem. Then there's no problem. It's also haram for the Muslim woman to pray and she doesn't have any socks on her feet. And that's because, again, the Prophet wasallam clearly informed us that Allah will not accept the prayer of the person until their aura is covered up. So the aura of the man outside of the salah is one thing and the aura of the man inside of the salah is another thing. The aura of the man outside of the salah is that if he's not praying and he's with other men, he has to have his navel covered all the way to his knees. He can appear in front of people in that way. But obviously he has to use discretion, but it's permissible. Outside of the prayer, the Muslim man can sit and he has his ihram on, the lower part, or he just has a towel on, he just has something on, the ma'wiz, something like those Somali, Yemenese people wear, the longi, he can have his upper body exposed and his low extremities exposed. But from the navel to the knee, that's the aura of the man. But that doesn't mean he should just go outside and just be like that. No, that's outside of the salat. Inside of the salat, inside of the salat, all of the man has to be covered up. As you're going to say, inshallah, from his shoulders, both of them, all the way down to at least his ankles, and that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam has shown us. And that comes from an authentic hadith. He said about the shoulders, قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا يُسَلِّيَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الثَّوْبِ الْوَاحِدِ لَيْسَ عَلَىٰ آتِقِهِ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ No one should pray in clothes and his shoulders are exposed. It's not permissible for the Muslim man to pray. And nothing is above his chest and covering up his chest. It's not permissible for the Muslim man to pray. And he's wearing the vest, the undershirt that just has the strap on it. He has to wear something that is covering his shoulders. It's not permissible for him to pray in a way other than that. And again, that hadith is authentic from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It shows an indication of something and that is especially people who don't pray in the masjid, Salatul Fajr, especially person gets up in the morning and he may just get up and he prays in the clothes that he went to sleep in last night. He may get up and he may pray in his pajamas. I don't say it's haram to pray in your pajamas. Abdullah ibn Abbas said to a man who prayed in the clothes that he slept in, would you go to the marketplace in those clothes? The man said, of course not. He said, then Allah has more right to beautify yourself when you stand before Allah Azza wa Jal. When Allahi al a'la. So if you don't find yourself, find it easy to go outside in pajamas, although there are some people who will do that, but they don't have any adab, they don't have any tartib. The point here is, in the deen, when it comes to salat, 
the shoulders have to be totally covered up. It's not permissible to have one thing covering your shoulder. And that goes to show the impermissibility. For those of us who make Umrah and Hajj, you may see the individual in the beginning of your Umrah and your Hajj, when you have to run around the Kaaba three times. That is the only time doing Umrah and Hajj that you unwrap and uncover your right shoulder and you put your ihram around you like that and you jog around the Kaaba if you have the ability to do that. That's the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when it's time to pray, it is not permissible to pray in that way because there's a prohibition. The Prophet commanded and he prohibited, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person from praying with his shoulders or shoulder being exposed. Both of them have to be covered up. So those of you who get the opportunity to perform Hajj or Umrah and you put on that ihram, you should always keep your shoulder covered up. If you can do that, it's permissible when you're in your tent or wherever you're at, you can sit with it off if it's hot, if you want to do that. But you have to use discretion. You have to use discretion about who's around you. But when it's time to pray, that ihram has to be brought over the shoulders. In addition to that, one of the mistakes that is made doing the prayer is the issue of al-isbal. There's a common mistake, al-isbal. The fact that a person, what he's wearing, his lower extremities, to cover up his legs, his thighs, his private part front and back, akramakum Allah. It is a common practice. You won't find any masjid except the vast majority of masjids. They have this problem here in it. And that is al-isbal in the salat. There are a number of hadith pro prohibiting and making it impermissible for a Muslim man to pray and his lower garments exceed below his ankle bone. Some of them are authentic and some of them are not authentic. From what is authentic is the statement of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, من أسبل إزاره في صلاته خيلاء فليس من الله في فليس من الله في حل ولا حرام. He said, any man who wears his whatever, the low extremities, the ma'wiz, you know what they wear in, in uh, Somalia, what they wear in Yemen, what they wear in Indonesia and in Thailand, the longi, you just wrap it up and twist it up. He wears that, he wears the thobe, he wears the sirwal khamis, whatever he wears. That's covering the bottom of his extremity. The Nabi, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anyone who does this with khuyala, with arrogance in his prayer, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to do with his prayer. Allah, that has nothing to do with his prayer. There are many other hadith. Some of them are not authentic and some of them are authentic. And it goes to show again that the Muslim has to take... Uh, a look at this issue and to be a bit serious about this issue because, again, if this is what's being done every single day, then it's going to have an impact and an effect on his prayer. So he prays all his life and he's trying to practice and he's making efforts and he comes to the masjid with ikhlas and he himself says, Iman goes up because of the efforts that he's making. But he's doing something or he's not doing something that he should be doing. And as a result of that, the prayer is being depleted bit by bit. So the Nabi described the prayer of the person and he told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person may come to his prayer and he only gets 90% of his prayer, 80% of his prayer, 70% of his prayer, 60%, 50, 40, 30, 10%. And then there's a person who comes to his prayer and he doesn't get anything from his prayer. Anything. So many people hear that hadith and they think that that hadith is only referring to the one who is not paying attention or the one who's eating haram or the one who is making shirk and all of that is true. What about the one who's looking at other people and he has isbal in his salat every day? It's not an issue with him. So we have to be stingy, we have to be serious, we have to have hirs, try not to be of those people, not to be of those people. So it's not permissible to pray musbil. From that as well, ikhwani, and we mentioned this a few times before, a person wants to avoid al-isbal in his prayer, so he rolls his pants up, he rolls his pants legs up. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, umirtu an asjuda ala sab'atan, 
I have been prohibited. I have been commanded to pray on seven organs, seven bones, seven. وَأَنْ لَا أُكُفُّ شَعْرًا وَلَا ثَوْبًا And I have been prohibited from rolling up my hair and from rolling up my thob. The seven things that he was commanded to prostrate on has been illustrated in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَسْتُدُ عَلَى سَبَعَ أَعْضَمْ I've been commanded to pray, to prostrate on seven bones. And then he went and he told the people. He said, عَلَى الْأَنْفْ وَأَشَارَ إِلَى الْجَبْحَ He said, I have to prostrate on my nose. He mentioned the nose and he pointed to his head, his forehead. So the forehead and the nose constitute one. And on my two fingers, on my two hands, that's three. And on my knees, it's five. And on the tips of my toes, that's seven. And he said, I've been prohibited from rolling my clothes up and my hair in the salat, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So as we mentioned many times before, if an individual wants to roll his pants up to avoid this prohibition that we mentioned about al-isbal, the correct way of doing that is first, wearing clothes that come from where we come from. And those clothes that you wear from where we come from, the thob, the sirwal al-khamis, whatever it happens to be, and then to make sure that it in and of itself is above the ankle bone. He wants to wear a sirwal or the bantalon that many of the ulama looked at as being makruh, disliked for the Muslim to wear that. The one who wants to wear that, okay, then what he should do is he should cut them and have them hemmed so that they'll always be in the position in which they are above his ankle. After that, Akhwani, we come to the other issue, and that is the issue of pictures and images that are on our clothes. Pictures and images that are on our clothes. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying in some of his clothes in a khamisa and like a thob that he had. And that thob had images on it. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after praying, he stopped praying and he told them, take this and give it to a companion by the name of Abu Jahm ibn Hudayfa. They said, why ya Rasulullah? He said, because this is uh, distracting me. Because it's distracting me from my salat. That's one hadith. Another hadith that show us the reason why we should avoid clothing that has images, like the polo sign, and although the guy in the polo sign is on a horse, and the man is riding the horse, the polo player, he doesn't have features, so we're not going to say, as we took in Kitab al Tawheed, the impermissibility of having unnecessary pictures and so forth and so on, that really doesn't fit the description because you don't see the eyes, so a person may technically be able to get away from that. Maybe, Allah alam, is better to leave it. But anyway, in terms of images, we have the issue of Aisha radiallahu anha. She said that in her house, she had a curtain, and on that curtain were images. The Prophet started praying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and after the prayer, he said to them, Take this thing down because these images, they distracted me during the course of my prayer. And that wasn't on his clothes. It's off of his clothes, outside of his clothes. But the point is, like the first hadith, the, the images, it was a distraction. Hadith number three is the hadith of Aisha who said she herself had a thobe. And on that thobe, there were images. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he saw him when they were praying and he told her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't wear that in your salah. Don't wear that dress, that piece of clothing in your prayer. She said, so I took it off and I cut it up and I made something like a pillow out of that particular dress. And Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, explained that hadith and the benefit of the hadith is inside of Muslim. He said, from that hadith, we understand that any thob that has a picture in it on it, or praying towards anything that has a picture in it, or that distracts an individual in his prayer, then the least you could say is that it is dislike to pray in that thing, or on that thing, or towards that thing. So if a person has a thobe, 
On the fold, there's images. The person wants to pray. In his area of prayer, there are images. And Imam al nawawi from those three hadith that we mentioned, he said it's an indication that it is disliked for an individual to pray in a thob that has pictures on it, to pray on something that has pictures, or to pray towards something that has pictures, or something that will cause an individual to lose his uh, um, concentration. And this is why we mentioned in some of the masajid that we pray in, when the administration of a particular masjid brings in a carpet, and the carpet has designs and it has colors that in and of itself distracts an individual from the salat, then that carpet is disliked. Any and everything, the cell phone going off, any and everything that distracts from the prayer is something that should be avoided altogether. So this is an issue and an indication of what we're saying. They asked Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, a question. They said, what do you think of the person who wears a ring? And on the ring, there is an image of something. An image of something. Al-Imam Malik said, anything that has an actual image, like a picture image here, not like the prophet had his name written on there, something like that. But an image has a picture of something, a tiger, a lion, whatever. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, this thing shouldn't be worn by a Muslim, nor should especially during the time of the prayer. This thing should be avoided altogether. So this is an issue that is common, as I mentioned. The way that fashion is today, many people who wear shirts, designer shirts, and other than designer shirts, People are wearing things with images on them or, or huh? or logos like beer logos, for an example, all different kinds of stuff, all different kinds of things. So these things should be avoided. Person should come to the masjid with clothes that have nothing on them. Nothing at all. So that he doesn't distract himself nor distract people who are around him. Again, concerning the issue of what people do wrong in the prayer, there are many things. Rasulullah prohibited us from praying. Where the individual prays and he has his face covered and his mouth is covered. By the clothing that he's wearing. So in the cold season, an individual will wrap his face with a scarf, for an example. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa told the people, don't do that. Don't wrap your mouth, don't wrap your face up with anything. Another type of wrapping that's not permissible. Is that? It's cold. So an individual wraps himself up totally in whatever he's wearing. Like some of the Muslim countries, they have the, like you see those sheikhs wearing those uh, different, the bish, you know, the one like the sheikhs wear. They have some of those that are for the winter time. A person, if he's going to wear that, he should make sure that his hands go through the place where the arms go through and not wrap himself with the material alone. Or he wants to pray with a blanket. He shouldn't wrap the blanket around himself like that. And his arms are not free to do what they need to be doing as it relates to a ruku and sajda. They call that a summa'u. A summa'u. The Prophet wasallam prohibited the companions from a summa'u. There are different interpretations. Some of the scholars said a summa'u is isbal. He prohibited us from wearing things below our ankles. But the majority of them are of the opinion that a summa'u has everything to do with, inshallah, azawajal, the issue of wrapping oneself up in a blanket, in some type of clothing, and his arms are not out. He's mushtamil. He's mushtamil. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, azawajal, to give you brothers an opportunity 
to ask any questions first and foremost about what we mentioned today, what we mentioned today. And then if there, there's time, because the Adan is uh, in uh, 10 minutes, if there's time, we'll deal with other secondary questions. Tafadhi ya akhi kareem. Salam. We're going to come to that The brother's asking about closing the eye in the prayer Is that permissible? Is that permissible? The sunnah is to keep your eyes open And to look at the place of your sajda Where you're going to prostrate That's what the prophet did Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And that's what people should try to do But if an individual closes his eyes In order to concentrate more, better to cut down or to eliminate distractions. If he closes his eyes, he has the ability to concentrate more. Then this is something that is permissible, inshallah, because there's no prohibition of it. The Prophet ﷺ did other than that. He did other than that, but he didn't prohibit this thing being done. So if a person finds that's the way he concentrates, then it is permissible, inshallah, azawajal. Fadriyahi. What is the reason and the wisdom behind the woman wearing a hijab when she's praying? And also through extension to that, what is the reason behind a man covering up his aura as well in the prayer? Not just the woman, but the man as well. What is the reason for that? What's the hikmah behind that? From the hikmah is, it's not appropriate for a person to be naked. It is allowed for a person to take their clothes off at certain times, at certain times, and at other times is not permissible. He mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so yakunu fi ummati nisa'un kasiyatun ariyat. Going to be some women from my ummah who are going to be dressed, but they're not dressed. They have some clothes on, but they're not dressed. And although they had some clothes on, they were still blameworthy. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, when he created Adam and he created our mother Hawa, Salawatullahi wa Sallam wa Alihima, he created them and they were naked because that's how Allah created them. Once they realized after approaching the tree that they were naked, their fitrah told them, put the clothes back on or cover up your nakedness. So from that point on, Allah Azza wa Jalla has commanded and created the people to be shy about the nakedness being exposed, except to certain people and at certain times. The nakedness of the husband and the wife is different from the nakedness that the husband will have in front of his sons and his daughters. The wife will have in front of the sons and the daughters. No Muslim with adab and tartib is going to be naked in front of his children. None. Not going to happen. Something's wrong with that picture. So it's part of al-hayat. It's part of al-hayat. And as Allah Ta'ala's Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ مِنْ كَلَامِ النَّبُوَةِ الْأُولَىٰ إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِتْ From the speech that all the prophets told their people previously is, if you're not modest and shy, then do as you like. People will do whatever they want. So modesty in front of Allah, Azawajal. Allah has the right to be most shy. From. The hadith is clear. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Istahyu min Allahi haq al Be modest and be shy from Allah, the real shyness. And another hadith the Prophet mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Istahyu min Allah kama tastah, Istahyu min Allah kama tastahyuna min al rajul salih min bani qawmik. Be shy from Allah the way you're shy of a religious man from your community. So some of us, we're married. Some of us, we hang out together. And while we're together, the husband and the wife, when they're together, if his wife's father came to visit, he's going to be a certain way. Although it's his house, and that's his wife. If we're friends and we're hanging out, an older person came, we're going to behave in a particular way. So Allah Azawajal's prophet told the people, be shy of Allah with that same thing you have for someone who's righteous. He comes in, you're going to be on your best behavior. So as it relates to the salat, 
the closest that the slave is to Allah is in his sajda. So he should approach that issue with modesty. Fadl ya akhi. Salam wa rahmatullah. Now, this is a good question, Ikhwani, that the brother is saying. The hadith that we mentioned just now is said, Man asbala izarahu fi salatihi khuyala'in falaysa min Allahi fi hallin wa la haram. Anyone who wears his clothes below his ankles with pride, then Allah wouldn't have anything to do with his salat. He does that in the salat. Allah doesn't have anything to do with it in the salat. And many of the ahadith mention that. But there are some of the ahadith, as we mentioned many times, where he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, general hadith, and he didn't make the taqeed, lam yuqayyid al-hadith. He said, ma taht al-ka'bayn fahuwa finnar. Anything below the ankle bones is in the hellfire. And he didn't mention anything about khuyala or anything other than that. So we have to take those specific hadith and we ask to also understand them with the generality of the amum of the other hadith that were mentioned. So it should be avoided altogether, altogether. Khurujin min al khilaf. Surat al an'am. Al an'am. Huh? Fadl. Cover their hands with what? Gloves? What do you mean? If a woman wants to cover her hands and wear gloves in the prayer, it's permissible. There's no man if she wants to, but it's permissible for her to show her hands in her face. So if she wants to wear gloves, permissible. She wants to cover up her face, it's permissible. What she cannot do is perform an umrah, hajj. If she has an ihram on, then the Prophet told them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the woman who's making Hajj or Umrah should not wear a niqab and a kafazain. That's an authentic hadith. And although he said they shouldn't do it, Aisha said, but when we used to pray, we used to make Hajj and Umrah from the zahma and the crowd, we would cover ourselves. We would bring the stuff over. But she didn't wear, they didn't wear niqabs all the time. But if there were men around, they would cover themselves and they had their ihrama. But that hukum is for Umrah and Hajj. As for Salat, it's permissible for her, permissible for her to pray with her gloves and her niqab because there's no prohibition of that. So if she wears niqab, for an example, she wears niqab, and she wears gloves, and she prays in Mecca where men are coming back and forth, or she prays the Eid, for an example, somewhere where there's men, it's permissible for her to pray with her niqab on and with her gloves. Fadliyahi Sa'ad. Blood doesn't break wudu at all because there's no delil for that. So we say that the blood of the human being is not najasa unless it's the blood that comes from the woman during that particular time of the month, akramakumullah. But to have a bloody nose, it doesn't break your wudu. To get your tooth pulled, it doesn't break your wudu. If blood gets on your hand, on your clothes, it doesn't break your wudu. The blood of the human being is not najis. It's not from najasa unless it's the blood of the woman, akramakumullah. How do we know that? We know that because the companions used to make jihad fi sabirillah and they used to get hit and they had wounds and they were still praying. One companion even was guarding the people while they were sleeping and he was praying and he got shot. He continued to pray although he was bleeding. So during the war, they'll get hit. Okay, what are they going to do? Not pray after that? They're going to pray. So there's no harm in this issue of there's no harm in the issue of blood and, uh, as for the woman's uh, blood at that time of the month or the blood of a nifas when she has a baby and the prophet sallallahu alaihi told the lady to clean it off of her clothes if it got on her clothes which goes to show is from the najasat should be avoided
all the time, all the time. And it becomes worse inside of the prayer. And it becomes worse if it's done with arrogance. So if a person does it with arrogance, it's really bad. But if he does it and he's not doing it out of arrogance, it's still bad, but not like the one who does it in arrogance. But there are times when a person's clothes, he may wear some clothes that has isbal. For an example, he has a new outfit. He has a new outfit that was packed for him. And he travels somewhere in order to perform their aid in that outfit. Or to wear for Juma. And it's brand new. When he puts it on, he realizes, oh, this is a bit long. It's a bit long. And he doesn't have anything else. He can wear that. He can go ahead and wear it because he has an excuse. It wasn't done intentionally. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his clothes used to fall down because they were too big. So they would fall down, they would fall down. When he heard that hadith, that the Prophet wasallam said, the person who drags his thobe out of anger, out of arrogance, go to the hellfire. Abu Bakr said, but what about my clothes? I pull them up and they go down. I pull them up and they go down. He said, you're not from those people who do it out of arrogance. You do it because of that reason you just said. So some people want to use this hadith as a proof. If you don't use it, do it out of arrogance, it's okay. There's a difference between what Abu Bakr was doing. Abu Bakr said, I pull them up and they go down. And I pull them up and I go down. This person, he didn't pull them up at all. They're down all the time. So he was, as he said, in the atahudubihi. I keep pulling it up and it keeps going down. So then Nabi he told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're not from the people who do it out of khuyala. You do it because of the reason you mentioned. So we're gonna stop here, inshallah, Azu Jalakhwani Tuesday, mistakes in salah, Wednesday, the fiqh of fasting, and not everything, just some of the more important issues bidinilahi ta'ala. Hada. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته You wrote it.